You wanna know something I really enjoy? Looking at graphs. Now before you turn off the video, let me explain. I specifically like the kind of graphs where the x-axis is time and you... You know what, let's maybe start with taking a look at how a graph works. Just to make sure we're all on the same page here. This is a line graph. Specifically, it's a diagram over thefts per 1,000 vehicles in the UK. The x-axis, that's the horizontal one, stretches between the years 1990 and 1999. And the y-axis starts at zero, that's zero thefts per 1,000 vehicles, and it goes all the way up to 25, okay? Now, this blue line is the data at hand. And now, this data can absolutely be interesting on its own, I think that the real interesting stuff happens when you compare this set of data to another set of data to find the correlations. Here's another graph. The time span on the x-axis is, as you can tell, the exact same, but let's change the value of the y-axis to just going from 0 to 1. Now this is a graph of amounts of me being alive. As we can see here, between 1990 and all the way to 1992, there really isn't much going on here with the line constantly resting at a stable zero. But in 1993, we see a huge influx all the way up to one, which continues all through the rest of the diagram. Now let's take these two graphs and overlay them. Note how the number of car thefts in the UK seems to drop significantly just around the same time that I was introduced to the world. Coincidence? I'll leave that up to you. But now you get what I'm saying, right? Two sets of data and how they correlate. That is what fascinates me and that is what we're gonna be investigating in this video. It is now dark outside. Explain that, science. So, the earnings of American actor Brad Pitt and the amount of ice cream consumed by the average American between the years 2001 and 2009. Let's check out the graph. Again, the x-axis represents time and this black line is ice cream consumed per American. Now, this red line is Brad Pitt's earnings. This is a correlation of 91.4%. Four percent. But why? Now, as we all know, if two different graphs happen to correlate, there must be a scientific explanation. So I thought to myself that this has got to be a question of just doing the right sort of research, which I did. So if this is confusing to you, stick around and I'll explain to you exactly how Brad Pitt's income and ice cream consumption in America go together. If he wasn't already, Brad Pitt was really cemented as a household name after the success of Fight Club in 1999. Following this enormous success, Pitt was quickly cast in Steven Soderbergh's Ocean's Eleven, which was a huge success and grossed over $450 million worldwide. Now this might seem like the most noteworthy moment of this year for Brad Pitt, but for us, it isn't. Because it was that same year during his cameo as Will Colbert on the set of Friends that Pitt first met Anthony Greenfield. Anthony was at the time working with the camera department as head of second unit of photography. Reportedly, the two quickly developed a bond over their shared interest in motorcycles and photography. Now, Anthony wasn't the only member of the Greenfield family working in Hollywood. In fact, the reason he had gotten this gig on Friends in the first place was due to his brother. And that brother, well, if you haven't guessed it already, Ronald P. Greenfield. Now with that name, I think some of you are starting to put the pieces together already, but let's continue. Ronald P. Greenfield first modestly entered the indie film scene in 1994 with the relationship drama The Highest of Stakes. Receiving mixed reviews and quickly falling into obscurity, Ronald was determined to make his next film according to his exact vision. And that vision was, well, the 1998 neo-noir coming-of-age thriller Nothing But Beeps. Nothing But Beeps managed to not only get into Sundance Film Festival, but won a record-breaking seven separate awards, including Best Dialogue, Best Cinematography, and Best Sound Design. This unprecedented success from basically an unknown director 
quickly garnered the attention of Warner Brothers, who swiftly picked Ronald up to create his next film under their name. Now, upon hearing that his brother has striked up a friendship with Hollywood superstar Brad Pitt, Ronald quickly called up Anthony asking him to arrange a dinner for the three of them. According to Pitt in later interviews, this pretty modest dinner consisting of ramen and cans of Pepsi laid the entire foundation of the several years of collaboration to come. But there is one detail about the Greenfields that I haven't yet mentioned. How could Ronald, a 22-year-old with no prior involvement in the film industry, go from seemingly coming out of nowhere to creating not one but two feature-length films almost entirely on his own? Well, with a little thing called ice cream. Because perhaps the name Greenfield sounds familiar to you. If not, how about his father's best friend Ben Cohen? And no, I'm not talking about the Cohen brothers. I'm talking about Ben Cohen and Jerry Greenfield. Now you're probably seeing how this all goes together. Gathering funds through his father, Ronald created his first two feature films. After the success of the second one, Warner Brothers picked him up and upon doing so, also struck a deal with Ben & Jerry's Homemade Holdings Incorporated. Ronald was slated to produce the summer blockbuster of 2002 and now Brad Pitt was on board. Unfortunately, due to scheduling conflicts with the people over at Miramax Films, Pitt couldn't take part in the production until after wrapping up his performance in George Clooney's directorial debut, Confessions of a Dangerous Mind. And the project had to be pushed forward one year. But in July of 2004, the film finally premiered. Anything is Popsicle was a 92-minute comedy drama about Ben Creamton, a successful lawyer played by Brad Pitt, who after a romantic evening with a woman whose name he never caught, quits his job, buys a used ice cream truck and hits the road, together with his loyal potato-loving canine sidekick, Benny, in order to track her down. Now, despite launching the film worldwide all in one week, and with the Ben & Jerry's limited edition sack of taters flavor, the film was... a failure. And a pretty big one at that. Grossing just about $75 million worldwide with a budget just shy of $150 million, this could be considered nothing else but a failure. And the numbers wasn't all, as critics didn't hold back either. Pitt's performance was described as exhaustingly dull and highly unbelievable by Susan O'Creody in the New York Times, and Peter Scharmanger of The Sun went as far as to call it perhaps the most embarrassingly obvious attempt at selling product through a film since The Wizard, 1989. Ouch. Despite this, however, Pitt really believed in the brand and their collaboration. So much so that in 2005 he entered into a partnership with them and he could be seen sporting their branded clothes at almost every event he attended that year, including the red carpet premiere of Mr. and Mrs. Smith. 2006 was the year of the ice cream, according to Pitt, and he wasn't wrong. The premiere of his ABC miniseries Here's the Scoop, Into the Pit of It, was received so well that it was turned into a feature-length documentary bearing the same name. Despite never getting a DVD release, it garnered something of a cult following. But in the subsequent years following this, the contract between Pitt and Ben & Jerry's finally came to an end. And according to a Ben & Jerry spokesperson, the cooperation between them ended on good terms, citing that they simply wanted to go in different directions. Brad Pitt has, however, denied all questions about the partnership ever since it ended. Now, as I was walking you through this frankly fascinating story about the history of Brad Pitt's involvement in the ice cream business, you could probably recognize several of the titles and key people involved. And this is why I'm so fascinated with statistics. If you just dig deep enough, there really is no such thing as coincidence when it comes to statistics. And if you're still not convinced, I think this next story might make you. Now it's bright outside again. How are they getting away with this? So, here's the consumption of 2% milk between the years 2000 and 2009, counted in gallons per person. And this red line is the sales of vinyl records.
what we're looking at here is a correlation of 90.4%. But why? Well, to make sense of this one, we need to understand a little bit about the inner workings of your brain. Your brain, or any human brain really, consists of three main parts or categories, those being the forebrain, the midbrain, and the hindbrain. After this, the brain is usually divided into what is known as lobes. The lobes in question are the frontal lobe, the temporal lobe, parietal lobe, and the occipital lobe. The frontal lobe is responsible for things like your personality traits, decision-making, and physical movement. The parietal lobe handles identifying objects, the location of said objects, and your spatial relationship to them. The occipital lobe handles your eyesight, and your temporal lobe deals with short-term memory, speech, smell recognition, and, most importantly for us, musical rhythm and sense of mineral deficiencies. Ever heard of the infamous brown note? The brown note is a hypothetical infrasonic frequency capable of causing fecal incontinence by creating acoustic resonance in the human bowel. In other words, it's a sound that, when heard, causes someone to poop. Now, the word hypothetical is very important there, as all attempts to demonstrate the existence of such a frequency have yielded no results, and as far as science can tell, there is no such thing as a functional brown note. However, believe it or not, specific frequencies affecting the human mind in different ways is a very real phenomenon. Solfeggio frequencies are sounds that, by taking into account the specific diameters of the average human skull to essentially create a sort of vibration within specific areas of your brain, effectively allows your moods, needs, and sensations to be affected. For example, flickering frequencies between 8 Hz and 18 Hz have a tendency to affect the occipital lobe and thereby either removing or introducing color frequencies to your eyesight. Another example is the ADS, or Active Denial System, which is a high-powered beam of 95 gigahertz waves that police sometimes use to break up crowds during riots. Anyone in the line of sight of an ADS will feel like their skin is burning due to the effects of the frequencies on your frontal lobe. And another example, around 195 hertz, we have this sound. The hiss of a standard 33 RPM vinyl record. Now granted, there are many other frequencies at play in this here audio, and the 195Hz one that we are after might not even really be in this specific recording, seeing how it's a digital recording of an analog signal. But nevertheless, the 195Hz sound comes through very clearly on the hiss and crackles of a vinyl record, and that frequency just so happens to perfectly affect parts of your temporal lobe when consumed frequently. More specifically, it affects the, and I have to apologize for the pronunciation here, fusiform gyrus, which is responsible for letting you know when you're thirsty, hungry, or have a lack of important vitamins and minerals. Minerals like, for example, calcium. So to make a long story short, while vinyl records were the most popular format for playing music on your home stereo, our brains were, unbeknownst to us, getting stimuli pretty much every time we turned on our favorite record, and it just so happened to tell us that, hey, maybe get some milk. And then the next time you're at the store and walking by the milk aisle, you're more likely to feel an unexplainable urge to pick up a 2% carton of milk. Science is... Truly amazing. Well, I hope you enjoyed this little foray into the wonderfully strange world of statistical correlations and the 100% true and factual stories and explanations behind them. <clears throat> Now before we end things off, I want to say this. Despite whatever opinion you may have regarding the scientific integrity or level of truth in all the stuff that I've been saying in this video, I want to genuinely, like no joke, genuinely say this. The graphs and statistical data that I've used in this video are actually 100% real and they all come from this book Spurious Correlations by Tyler Vigen. Well, that's very hard to see, I'll put up a picture. I'm gonna put a link in the description to where you can find the book. It won't be an affiliate link. I'm not endorsed to talk about this. I have nothing to do with the author of this book, but it is a very fascinating read. If you, like me, are fascinated by these kind of wild coincidences that... Uh, these scientific conclusions that can be drawn uh, from statistical correlations. 
Fuck. And with that said, remember, you can always trust statistical data and correlations between graphs are never coincidental. Hope to see you in the next one. Bye-bye.